Some events are designed with a singular focus in mind. For example, weddings. Weddings are designed around the legal or spiritual union of two adults. It would be shocking to show up for a wedding and find yourself discussing the best man or the officiant instead of the happy couple. Courts martial are also designed with a singular focus in mind, the administration of justice. If a court martial derails and becomes about the actions and conduct of the attorneys and their superiors, the administration of justice gets very messy very quickly. This is Conduct Unbecoming. I'm Erin, and I'm your host. Eric Gilmet was a senior in high school in Grand Rapids, Michigan, when he met with a Navy recruiter for the first time. He had been accepted to Western Michigan University, a straight shot south from his hometown, and he knew he wanted to enter the medical field. But he wasn't sure how he would pay for his university education, and he didn't want to waste his parents' time or money. When the recruiter spoke with him, the recruiter said the Navy could help pay for college and could train him to be a corpsman. They could get him a head start into the medical field. Gilmet signed up same day and returned home to tell his parents of his new plan. He would join the Navy, get money for college, and then maybe eventually become a doctor. They were stunned by this development. They hadn't heard this in his plans before. This would have been sometime around January 2002, just a few months after the 9-11 attacks. After he graduated from high school, Gilmet officially enlisted in the Navy on September 3, 2002. Over the next few years, he spent some time with the infantry and on deployments. Around the time he turned 24, so maybe around 2007, he began the wind-down process for ending his active service. However, he discovered a new passion and a new goal— He wanted to become more specialized and work specifically with the reconnaissance marines, recon marines. Gilmet re-enlisted and worked earnestly towards becoming a recon corpsman, working on the combat side of medicine. Recon marines are a commander's eyes and ears on the battlefield. They work in teams of six to conduct missions and specialized surveillance. After completing his training, Gilmet continued his career of service. Eventually, Gilmet and his Marines deployed to Iraq. There, they welcomed a new year together. In the early morning hours of January 1, 2019, Marine Gunnery Sergeant Josh Negron, Gunnery Sergeant Danny Dreyer, and Chief Petty Officer Gilmet partied at an off-base bar in Erbil, Iraq. They were drinking, which was a violation of their deployment orders. Rick Rodriguez, a defense contractor and retired Army Master Sergeant, was also at the bar. There isn't much information available about the events of the early morning, so I've pieced together what's out there as best I can. Security footage from the bar showed Rodriguez confronting Gilmet and starting an argument inside. Gilmet tried to defuse the situation, but it's not clear how he tried to do that. Ultimately, the bar staff removed Rodriguez from the bar, but he didn't head home. He was outside when the trio of friends, later dubbed the Marsoc Three, left the bar. They again found themselves in a row with Rodriguez. Rodriguez allegedly became aggressive, punching Dreyer. Dreyer pushed Rodriguez away, and Negron stepped in and punched Rodriguez, knocking him to the ground. I don't think he regained consciousness after this punch. Instead of taking Rodriguez to the hospital or to a doctor, they left him with Gilmet, an experienced corpsman. At some point, another contractor got brought into the loop and checked on Rodriguez, It was this contractor that summoned a doctor during the night when Rodriguez stopped breathing. 
Rodriguez received an emergency medical transport to a military hospital in Germany that was better equipped to treat him. But he died a few days later on January 4, 2019. Prosecutors charged Gilmet with violating a lawful order for drinking involuntary manslaughter, negligent homicide, and obstructing justice. They believed Gilmet was culpable for all of this because he failed to move Rodriguez to a hospital in spite of his medical training. Gilmet hired his lead counsel, some privately retained civilian defense counsel, in the weeks that followed Rodriguez's death. A year later, in March 2020, Gilmet specifically requested Marine Corps Captain Thomas be assigned as his military defense counsel. The previous military defense counsel was reassigned to other cases, and Captains Thomas and Riley began working on Gilmet's case. Negron and Dreyer were charged with involuntary manslaughter, negligent homicide, dereliction of duty, and violating a lawful order, that order prohibiting drinking while they were on deployment. The Marine Corps Air Station Cherry Point panel convicted them only of violating a lawful order, and they received no punishment. Attorneys for the two later petitioned the Marine Forces Special Operations Command, or MARSOC, commander, asking him to set aside their convictions in accordance with the court-martial judge's recommendation. On April 28, 2023, Major General Trollinger declined to offer the two clemency. Both went before an administrative separation board on August 1st, 2023. The board recommended that they be allowed to retire with honorable discharges at their current ranks. Gilmet's trial was set for January 2022 at Camp Lejeune, North Carolina. His trial would begin three years after the incident that led to Rodriguez's death. It was his turn in the hot seat. As attorneys on both sides of the case approached the home stretch, Captain Thomas, one of the Marine Corps attorneys tasked with defending Gilmet, attended a briefing for Camp Lejeune Marine Corps defense lawyers. On that day, November 18, 2021, the Deputy Director of Community Management and Oversight of the Marine Corps Judge Advocate Division, Colonel Shaw, came to Camp Lejeune to discuss changes to the Judge Advocate Division. The meeting was to explain a new billet, one in which senior judge advocates, as opposed to the command, would be the referral authority for certain crimes. The new prosecutors would, for the first time, have prosecutorial discretion. Captain Thomas asked Colonel Shaw what would be done to protect these senior judge advocates from outside influences. He cited the example of measures designed to protect defense counsel from similar pressures, namely that defense counsel had a separate chain of command that handled their fitness reports. Colonel Shaw found fault with Captain Thomas's logic and explained that defense attorneys may think they are shielded, but they are not protected. Evidently, he used that phrase shielded but not protected more than once. He looked Captain Thomas in the eye and continued, You think you are protected, but that is a legal fiction. Captain Thomas, I know who you are, I know what cases you are on, and you are not protected. Colonel Shaw intimated that the Marine Corps judge advocate community is small and that people on promotions boards would know what Captain Thomas did. Colonel Shaw referenced judge advocates who'd previously served as defense counsel on war crimes cases for an extended period of time. He said they should have promoted, but didn't. When news of this interaction got to Major General Bly on November 30th, he immediately removed Colonel Shaw from his position and ordered an investigation. Major General Bly was the highest-ranking attorney in the Marine Corps and served as the staff judge advocate to the Commandant. The investigation uncovered text messages from Colonel Shaw sent before this wild meeting at Lejeune, which indicated that Colonel Shaw believed Captain Thomas would turn down a prestigious selection in an attempt to remain defense counsel for another tour. In addition to ordering an investigation, Major General Bly swore an affidavit that the Marine Corps legal community does not penalize or punish defense counsel for serving as defense counsel, 
that it was not a bar to their promotions or their careers. He praised defense work as vital to the success of the military justice system and encouraged zealous advocacy and continued litigation development. Captains Thomas and Riley consulted their state bars and conflict-free counsel to get additional guidance on the ethical implications of this interaction and whether an actual conflict existed. They consulted with their senior defense counsel, and together everyone arrived at the conclusion that Colonel Shaw's comments must be truthful, that it was unlawful command influence, and that they had an actual conflict on their hands. Captain Thomas believed that he could no longer adequately represent Gilmet due to this conflict of interest. The two interests in conflict were the interest and ethical obligation to zealously advocate for his client, and his interest in continuing to serve as an attorney in the United States Marine Corps. Captain Thomas shared these concerns with his client, Eric Gilmet. In the weeks that followed, Gilmet filed a motion to dismiss the charges against him for unlawful command influence. The motion alleged that Colonel Shaw's statements impermissibly interfered with Gilmet's right to counsel, because the statements shook Gilmet's faith in Captain Thomas. Unlawful command influence is when someone who bears the mantle of command uses or appears to use their authority to influence the outcome of military judicial proceedings. It can be either actual unlawful command influence or apparent unlawful command influence. The trial court judge had a defendant who didn't think his defense counsel could continue to represent him and defense counsel that said they also did not believe they could continue to represent the defendant. On December 21st, 2021, the military judge heard arguments to determine whether to grant the motion to dismiss. The judge found that Gilmet met his burden of producing some evidence of unlawful command influence. Then, the burden shifted to the government to prove that the command influence would not affect Gilmet's case. Before hearing arguments about whether or not unlawful command influence would affect Gilmet's case, the judge informed Gilmet that he had the right to be represented by conflict-free counsel. The judge paused the proceedings and gave Gilmet the opportunity to consult with additional counsel, counsel that weren't Thomas or Riley, and asked Gilmet if he would consent to releasing Captains Thomas and Riley. Gilmet had two options. He could consent to the release of his military defense counsel, or he could provide informed consent to their conflicted representation. Gilmet consented to releasing his counsel and the judge dismissed Captains Thomas and Riley. The judge had to settle this conflict question first. He had to ensure the proceedings did not continue until the issue of conflicted counsel was addressed. I offer that Gilmet technically always had conflict-free counsel in his private civilian defense counsel. But without the defense judge advocates, the judge pushed out the hearing on the motion to dismiss by a month. This was to allow everyone time to prepare arguments regarding the effect of the unlawful command influence. The government, in arguing against the motion to dismiss, needed to show that the unlawful command influence had no effect on Gilmet's court-martial. And to be very clear, I do not envy being in the government's position— it would be a massive challenge to argue that the comments would not affect Gilmet's defense when two lawyers were excused from representation as a direct result of the comments. You can't look a judge in the eye and say there's no impact when he's just ordered one. The prosecutors argued that Colonel Shaw's statements were false and that the Marine Corps took appropriate steps to cure the apparent unlawful command influence from Colonel Shaw's comments. To support these arguments, prosecutors offered a variety of facts. They cited that seven of the last eight staff judge advocates to the Commandant had significant defense counsel experience. They reviewed all the lieutenant colonels and colonels, that's 05s and 06s, in the Marine Corps judge advocate community 
and found that over one quarter of them served at least two tours in defense billets. Government counsel submitted affidavits from members of the Manpower Management Division and Judge Advocate Division detailing what happened in the slating, assignment, and promotions processes. These were the folks in the best position to correct Colonel Shaw's erroneous assertions about how promotions work. These were the experts in the field. They introduced that sworn statement from Major General Bly, describing the mission-critical service defense counsels provide and asserting that serving as defense counsel was not detrimental to a Marine's career. This body of evidence was offered to show that Colonel Shaw's comments were false and there was no secret judge advocate division conspiracy against defense counsel. I read this to mean that any statements Colonel Shaw made were not a reflection of judge advocate division policy, but rather his own personal biases. Consequently, his comments could only be viewed as apparent unlawful command influence. Government counsel further offered evidence that, following his statements, Colonel Shaw was suspended and then permanently removed from the slating process for Marine Corps judge advocates. Firing Colonel Shaw from the position corrected for his personal bias and prevented his opinions from affecting Marine judge advocate careers. The court-martial judge weighed the evidence before him and found it insufficient. He found that Colonel Shaw's actions constituted both actual and apparent unlawful command influence and created an intolerable tension and conflict between Gilmet and his specifically requested defense counsel. He dismissed all charges and specifications with prejudice on February 9, 2022. When something is dismissed with prejudice, it means the prosecutor doesn't get another bite at the apple. He doesn't get a chance to do it differently a second time around. This is a dramatic step because the prosecutor is stripped of the opportunity to seek justice for the underlying crime, to provide closure for Rick Rodriguez's widow and children. All right, legal beagles. Like a gluten-free dessert, this section is going to be dense. The government appealed the dismissal to the Navy and Marine Corps Court of Criminal Appeals, the NMCCA. The NMCCA called Colonel Shaw's statements as shocking as they were incorrect. In fact, they asserted, the statements were so patently false that they could not be misconstrued as unlawful command influence. In August 2022, the NMCCA reinstated the charges against Eric Gilmet finding that the trial court judge abused his discretion when he dismissed the charges with prejudice. Gilmet's appellate team petitioned the Court of Appeals for the Armed Forces, CAF, to settle the issue. In the CAF opinion, the court intimated that the appropriate government response may have been Colonel Shaw holding a follow-on meeting with defense counsel at Camp Lejeune to retract his prior remarks, apologize for overstepping his proper legal bounds, and assure defense counsel that there would be no adverse consequences for acting as zealous legal counsel. They wanted a mea culpa tour, preferably one that was recorded. Or, they suggested, Major General Bly should have specifically published his affidavit to the defense counsel at Camp Lejeune. Caff lamented that there was no reason to believe the affidavit would be seen by those who heard Colonel Shaw's statements. I have a slight difference of opinion with CAF right here. I would venture a guess that Major General Bly's affidavit almost certainly made the rounds. There was one thing Colonel Shaw did get right in his wild remarks at the meeting at Camp Lejeune. The Marine Corps legal community is small. In the same way retellings of Colonel Shaw's statements likely rippled out from Lejeune, I would expect the affidavit's contents got wide distribution. But we'll have to agree to disagree on this particular point. Major General Bly attesting to these details under oath was designed to get at exactly what CAF wanted, a publishable statement correcting the inaccurate comments from Colonel Shaw. Colonel Shaw, fired from his position, was not permitted to make further errors in corrective meetings with defense counsel, 
Major General Bly, who so clearly outranked Colonel Shaw, was perhaps a better and more reliable ambassador of the truth. Calf indicated that they didn't like that Colonel Shaw failed to take personal accountability for his comments. Colonel Shaw denied that his remarks were inappropriate and dismissed concerns about how they came across. He labeled it all as a misunderstanding and speculation at best. And Calf's preference here is generally fair. We all prefer to see people take specific accountability for their errors, especially when they are in leadership roles. It appears in this instance that dismissing the charges with prejudice was intended to try and correct bad behavior, to prevent unlawful command influence from tainting the fair administration of justice. We saw something similar in episode 4, in the Darnell case. There, we discussed the corrective measures taken to prevent police-gone-wild scenarios. I shared that illegally obtained evidence gets excluded because that's how you prevent constitutional violations in the future. Calf and the trial court judge seemed to believe that their decision will prevent prosecutors from going wild in the future and benefiting from unlawful command influence. The prosecutors here tried to battle against a conflict of interest they didn't create and apparently couldn't possibly remedy. They demonstrated that Colonel Shaw's beliefs and feelings were not facts and showed that there was no actual conflict, that Captains Thomas and Riley could not and would not be punished for defending Eric Gilman. What they couldn't change was how Captains Thomas and Riley felt about the comments from Colonel Shaw their subjective conflict. When the trial court judge asked Captains Thomas and Riley if they believed there was a conflict, there was nothing the government could do to prove that they didn't believe that. And that's where the trial judge could have, and I would argue should have, let Captains Thomas and Riley off the case and brought in military defense counsel that didn't suffer from the same subjective conflict. And listen, I have no idea what the outcome of a court-martial here would have been. The men more directly involved in the fistfight were convicted only for violating the ban on drinking alcohol, and I suppose that doesn't give me a lot of faith that the overnight watchman would have been found more at fault in Rodriguez's death. But by dismissing the charges with prejudice, the trial judge implied by my read one of two things. Either, first, Gilmet's right to counsel of his choice was absolute, or second, no military defense counsel could represent him without conflict. First, let's tackle the right to counsel of his choice. An accused's right to counsel is a constitutionally protected absolute. People wrapped up in American judicial systems have the right to an attorney and a competent one at that. Military defense counsel is detailed to an accused regardless of their financial situation. In the military, the accused has the further right to their choice of military counsel if they are reasonably available. They also have the right to civilian defense counsel at their own expense. Eric Gilmet hired private civilian defense counsel and had the benefit of his chosen military defense counsel. But when the trial judge dismissed the charges with prejudice instead of allowing alternate, conflict-free military defense counsel to step in, he made Gilmet's right to counsel of his choice absolute. When Captain Thomas told Eric Gilmet about Colonel Shaw's comments, he alleges that their relationship irrevocably changed. The trial court judge found that this strain couldn't be remedied and kicked everyone out of the sandbox by dismissing the charges instead of waiting for new, conflict-free military defense counsel. If Gilmet couldn't have his choice of military defense counsel, he wasn't going to need defense counsel at all. But that right to military defense counsel of choice is only if they are reasonably available. Subjectively conflicted counsel is obviously not reasonably available counsel. The Marine Corps honored Gilmet's request for the counsel of his choosing when he requested Captain Thomas. 
But how far does that request go? How far should it go? It would be untenable to guarantee Gilmet or any other military defendant the absolute right to the counsel of their choice. Military Defense Council PCS change billets and end their active service all the time. That's the nature of being in the military. Captain Thomas was himself weeks away from receiving new orders. If the trial judge didn't intend to make the right to counsel of their choice absolute, the second potential conclusion I arrive at is that no military defense counsel could be conflict-free in this case. To find actual unlawful command influence, you have to find that Colonel Shaw's comments were an accurate reflection of the inner workings of the Judge Advocate Division and the Marine Corps as a whole. And if we hold that possibility in our hands, we have to assume that if future promotions boards would hold defense work against Captain Thomas, they would hold it against any military defense counsel. If Colonel Shaw's comments created a conflict for Captain Thomas, they must create the same conflict for any military defense counsel. And the CAF opinion details that nothing the government did sufficiently addressed the alleged unlawful command influence. There was no way to scrub away the stain of the government's actions, of Colonel Shaw's statements. It wasn't enough that the government came forward with historical proof that people with significant defense counsel experience promoted to 05 and 06. It wasn't enough for experts to describe who sits on promotions boards, the information available to them, or how they make their decisions. It wasn't enough to fire Colonel Shaw from all slating decisions and remove him as the head of the Judge Advocate Division for his apparent personal feelings towards Marines serving as defense counsel. It wasn't enough for the highest-ranking lawyer in the Marine Corps to swear under oath that defense billets were not held against Marines at promotions boards. If none of this was enough to ensure that Captains Thomas and Riley could serve as conflict-free defense counsel for Eric Gilmet, how does the stain of Colonel Shaw's comments ever lift? If the trial court and CAF cannot accept Major General Bly's affidavit as fact, how is anyone serving in a defense billet supposed to? How can any judge advocate perform their ethical duties as a zealous advocate for a defendant without fear for their military career? The senior defense counsel at Camp Lejeune at the time wrote that Colonel Shaw's comments injected doubt as to whether any Marine Corps defense counsel could fulfill their creed to defend clients without fear of reprisal. The ruling that there was actual unlawful command influence underscores the senior defense counsel's point and draws into question the validity of military defense counsel as a whole. And I don't think that this is the intended interpretation of this outcome, but it's an aspect that I'm intrigued by. I think this was, most likely, a great example of being a zealous advocate for a client and leveraging the unplanned comments of one man to get the best results for that client. Frankly, the trial court judge very clearly believed that conflict-free military defense counsel did, in fact, exist because he made sure Gilmet consulted with counsel untainted by conflict before consenting to the release of Captains Thomas and Riley. To me, this decision indicates that the trial judge understood, somewhere, somehow, that Colonel Shaw's comments could not be taken as actual unlawful command influence. Maybe this case is just a blip on the radar, or maybe this case shakes the foundations of military justice. I am certainly curious to see what patterns emerge after this decision. And to a hyper-niche point, I found it hilarious that Gilmet's appellate counsel argued via brief that the NMCCA, the military's intermediate appellate court, didn't apply a deferential, clearly erroneous standard when reviewing the trial judge's dismissal of the charges. And it's funny to me because 
That's the whole point of the Intermediate Appellate Court in Military Justice. The NMCCA and its branch-specific equivalents were specifically established to be less deferential to trial courts than their civilian counterparts. They were created in this way to directly confront concerns of unlawful command influence on courts martial that didn't always have the benefit of lawyers. And if that's something that this appellate team wants to be upset about, I hope to find them similarly enraged about de novo factual sufficiency review and the lack of deference to trial court findings of fact. Thank you for listening. If you enjoyed today's episode, please take a moment to leave a review wherever you listen. I invite you to submit case suggestions and feedback to conductunbecomingpod at gmail.com or on conductunbecomingpod.com. Join me next time when I offer a very gentle reminder to Air Force Trial Counsel about victim impact statements. Until then, take care. Conduct and Becoming is a podcast where I get to talk about interesting crimes and cases that involve U.S. military service members. I research, write, and produce the podcast myself. The opinions expressed are my own, and perhaps it's obvious. Conduct and Becoming is not approved, endorsed, or authorized by the Department of Defense.